Okay, I think I'll begin. Uh, welcome everyone. I know some are still joining. I'm going to be um, starting with a few introductory words. My name is uh, Liz Myring. I'm the president of the Protein Society, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar on high-speed atomic force microscopy of proteins. It's a great pleasure for me to be introducing this really exciting research that we're going to hear about today. I'm going to start with um, a few general announcements before the presentations from our speakers. And just to note that this webinar is part of an ongoing series um, of webinars that the Protein Society brings to you. And uh, we're always welcoming of invitations from our community on topics, or if you want to organize a webinar, please reach out to us. You can find information uh, on our website. And uh, it's really about the science what we focus, the society makes it easy to host these webinars and um, those who are involved uh, have to focus on the science. So, and we thank Simon for leading us today in this topic. So let me just, hang on. Right. So um, we have, oh, there we go. Uh, the first announcement here, which is of our upcoming symposium in 2024. We have an annual symposium. This year it will be in Vancouver, Canada, and it's July 23rd to 26th. And you can find information on the program and other information uh, for the conference on our website. So I encourage you to have a look and come see us there. I also want to mention briefly our journal, Protein Science. So this uh, is a fantastic place to be publishing your exciting research. Um, our editor in chief is John Curian and uh, the impact is continuing to rise, which we're very excited about. So we look forward also to your submissions there. And um, that brings me to the topic today, high speed atomic force microscopy. So we have three exciting speakers today and I wanna thank them all for being here. Um, we're com they're coming to us from all around the world and uh, as are you, our audience. So I think we're really in for a treat because some amazing advances have been happening in high speed and atomic force microscopy and other advances in, in AFM. So we really have the leaders in the field here with us to uh, teach us more about what all the prospects for this, um, for this method and uh, what we can learn about proteins. So Simon Schering is coming us, to us from Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City, where he's a professor of physiology and biophysics. He trained as a biologist at the Biocentrum in the University of Basel, Switzerland, where he did his PhD with Andreas Engel and learned electron microscopy in AFM. After that, he went to France and was at INSERM and the Institute Curie in France for a number of years, first in the lab of Jean-Louis Rigaud, uh, learning membrane physical chemistry and developing AFM methods for studying native membranes. And then he came to the US after first establishing his independent group in France. He moved to Weill Cornell in 2017. So the focus of his research is AFM and cryoEM to study membrane phenomena, in particular, um, recent really exciting advances in overcoming AFM related technical and biological bottlenecks to get high resolution views of the dynamics of complex protein samples, particularly in membranes. Then our second speaker is George Heath, and uh, he is a university academic fellow at the University of Leeds in England since 2019. He's at the Asbury Center for Structural Biology. He did his PhD in physics at Leeds. The physicists developed these new methods for us. I shouldn't say that. I come from physics myself, but uh, it's it's um, this is the wonder of, of spreading all this information across disciplines. So he did a postdoc at Weill Cornell and at the School of Biomedical Sciences in Leeds. And his interests are in developing these techniques to study structure and dynamics of biomolecules at previously inaccessible time and spatial resolution. So uh, using physics and physical tools to understand biological processes that are related to health and disease. Then our third speaker, Takayuki Uchihashi, um, is uh, in Japan, and he's currently at Nagoya University, where he's a professor in physics. He did his PhD at Osaka University with Professor Seizu Morita, 
Then he obtained postdoctoral training at the Joint Research Center for Atom Technology in Tsukuba, Japan, and was a senior researcher also at Trinity College in Dublin, in Ireland, before he returned to Japan in 2004 to establish his own group. His research interests are single molecule imaging using AFM and scanning probe microscopy. So he studied a great many different proteins with single molecule techniques. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all three of our speakers. So just a brief technical thing, how we're going to do this. We have our three speakers and myself and Protein Society support staff uh, who will be seeing the chat. So in your screen, you can type questions into the chat at any time that you like, um, only we will see them. And then each speaker will give their presentation, which will be about 25 minutes. And then we'll have a brief question period, about five minutes. And after all the presentations are, have concluded, uh, one of the things that's really nice is we can have a discussion uh, from our experts and we'll incorporate more questions there. So um, you can get a, a sense of what the experts really think about, about what's happening now, what has been happening and what the prospects are. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Simon. Thank you all again so much for being here for our webinar, Simon, George and Takayuki. And uh, I'm excited to hear your, your presentations. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Everything's fine, good. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Liz, uh, Meyering and um, the- do I, do I see it? I'm not sure I do. Do I see it? I still, I'm gonna stop share. I got it. It's you there. can see it, okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Liz, uh, for the kind introduction and for the invitation for to for us to to uh, showcase high speed atomic force microscopy to the protein society, and also um, uh, thanks big thanks to 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 the team at the protein society and to the community at large. Uh, so my talk will be about high-speed atomic force microscopy for the study of protein structure and dynamics with a focus, as Liz uh, introduced, to um, membrane diffusive uh, protomer exchange and uh, conformational dynamics in ion channels. So uh, I would like to make a brief case about uh, the importance of uh, dynamic imaging. So uh, if we are considering this zoo trope that you can uh, see in the London Museum, and then you look, uh, would do a single particle analysis of, of that uh, particle here, you must come to the conclusion that the horse can fly. However, obviously the horse cannot fly uh, because uh, only one of the conformations of the horse literally has no uh, foot on the floor and appears to fly. In a more New Yorker perspective, as we as New Yorkers uh, spend a lot of time in Central Park, what we consider nature. Um, if we would to, were to, to image a flying blue jay, or if I would challenge you to draw a flying blue jay, you would draw possibly something like this or something like that. But also this is a, a conformational state of um, a flying blue jay, which is uh, quite unsuspected that the blue jay in flight has its leg, it, its wings entirely uh, folded to its body. And so my case, the, the point I want to make is that high-speed AFM um, giving a direct, is quite unique to give a direct access to time-resolved structural data. So it means that you can actually see the molecules on the single molecule level uh, as a function of their life timeline may re reveal such unexpected conformational uh, states. And uh, this is obviously of utmost importance to understand the molecule. And I believe that I will show you today a little bit something uh, as, as surprising as the blue jay uh, with its wings folded to the body. And what I'm going to talk about is a pentameric trip V3 channel with a dilated pore, which we uh, just uh, recently uh, have been able to publish. 
So a brief introduction to the trip V channels, which most likely you have uh, heard about extensively recently because of the uh, Nobel Prize has been awarded to David Julius, who uh, cloned Trip V1, the first Trip V1 channel, and Arden Padaputin, who actually also cloned uh, uh, and identified one of the Trip channels. Um, um, but so since then, uh, so, um, obviously, we are having more than 210 Trip channel structures and more than 130 Trip V channel structures. And the first structure of Trip V1 has actually been resolved uh, by Ethan Chen's lab in collaboration with David Julius. And this uh, feat has also kicked off the resolution revolution of cryo-electron microscopy. Another notable uh, uh, breakthrough has been the resolution of TRIP-V3, at least for my talk, uh, that has been performed in um, um, Sasha Sobolevsky's lab. Now, uh, about TRIP channel function, the TRIP channels are basically a little bit like our thermometer in our body. So we are expressing these uh, different versions of TRIP-V channels, and they are uh, gated at different temperatures, as you can see. And so when one or the other uh, TRIP channel starts to fire, it allows you to control your body temperature, but also to measure your environmental uh, temperature. And an interesting uh, fact is, for example, that TRIP-V1 that David Julius uh, identified first as the capsaicin receptor uh, is, is obviously also binding. Capsaicin is activated by uh, red chili pepper capsaicin. And this is the reason why when you eat uh, red chili pepper in a pizza or in, in Asian food, for example, you start to sweat very dramatically and this is not because your food is warm or because the capsaicin is somewhat warm it's because it's the same channel that also senses very high temperatures that uh, is activated so it tricks you into thinking that there is a high temperature similarly if you eat a candy that is full of mint and you breathe in through your mouth you will have this cold sensation and this is just the case because the mint receptor is also your cold receptor and for those of you who do sports, they, you, you may have used Tiger Balm, uh, put it on your skin, and you will have these hot and warm sensations. And this is because um, camphor and oregano and menthol uh, activate trip V3, which is in, expressed in the skin, and which is uh, temperature sensing around your body temperature. And um, that's the protein we study here. So to remind you of the sequence structure of a trip V channel, so you have the classical uh, pore domain, which is constituted of a helix uh, selectivity filter helix motif that is common to all channels in this family, also to the calves, the NAFs, and the potassium channels. And then like in the voltage gated channels, you have a voltage sensor like domain here. It's not uh, actively voltage sensing, but it's, it's the same structure a bundle of four helices. And then in the trip channels, you have this intracellular domains. That's an anchoring rich domain that hangs into like a skirt into the intracellular side. And on the C terminus, you have the trip helix in the C terminal domain. So now uh, for high-speed high AFM analysis, we reconstitute these channels into membranes. So we're studying these channels at ambient temperature and pressure in physiological buffer, and the channels are in membrane. And then we can acquire these high-speed AFM movies. So you can see here these membrane patches on the mica surface. And you can see when you zoom a little bit into these membranes, how the trip channels, where you can see the tetrameric structure, they uh, wiggle around a the place. They can diffuse a little bit if they have space, but due to the uh, dense packing that we uh, impose on them, they are not diffusing very fast, but they are not limited. They are not stuck to the surface. So now if you analyze the height in this region here, where you have a half of the image area is mica and then half is membrane, you can deduce, uh, since AFM is a topographic method, the height difference between the mica surface and the protein, which in this case is about 8.5 nanometer. And this 
relates beautifully to the overall thickness of the channel in cryo-electron microscopy, as you can see here. If there are two channels that stand relatively far away apart, you can actually measure the height from the top of the protein to the bilayer and to the next protein, and that is more than four nanometers. So we unambiguously image these channels in this case from the intracellular side. So it is the intracellular phase with the anchoring repeat domains that we are investigating uh, in our AFM uh, study. So now came as a big surprise that despite the fact that the more than 130 trip channels, V channel structures have revealed always tetrameric structures and that most of the channels are indeed tetramers in these membranes, we indeed found many molecules in these membranes that are beautifully star-shaped pentameric complexes, as you can see here in the movies, but also in these still, still images as highlighted here by the white arrowheads and these made about up about 10 percent of the channel population we could then zoom into these uh, regions where tetramers and pentamers coexist and we can find that they are happily uh, living next to each other in the membrane and uh, wiggling around their position diffusing a little bit uh, with each other using high-speed atomic force microscopy now um, we can analyze this computationally a little bit more. So the tetramers, without any surprise, have a periodicity of 90 degrees in their radial profile, while the pentamers reveal a 72 degrees periodicity uh, in the radial profile, which allows unambiguous classification of these molecules. If we average then the, the pentamers, we find that the central cavity is enlarged in the pentamers, and they're also a little bit bigger, which seems to be a very intuitive finding regarding a rearrangement of the subunits from a tetramer to a pentamer. We also could show that the height, the protrusion height now, um, investigated over thousands, uh, hundred thousands of pixels in on the tetramer and the pentamer are uh, without uh, within uh, the hundreds of an angstrom of, of a nanometer um, identical between tetramer and pentamer. So they have um, indistinguishable uh, protrusion height. So then, uh, obviously, you can still say maybe this is a coincidence that is a contaminant that sits there and that has just looks like a trip channel and is a little bit having the same height as a trip channel. However, we uh, were then able to demonstrate reversibility, which in my view is by far the most powerful uh, message here. So as you can see in this movie, the, this, tetram, this molecule starts as a tetramer, captures a monomer and becomes a, a pentamer. Uh, I think that the, the, the transition is unambiguously cat caught here in, in on the movie we also um caught uh, pentamer tetramer transitions and we also were able to image entire tetramer pentamer tetramer and pentamer tetramer pentamer transitions so trip the trip three pentamer is clearly a reversible state in a dynamic equilibrium with the canonical uh, tetramer uh, through membrane diffusive protomer exchange. So now from these observations, we have 12 uh, uh, observations where we can see tetramers uh, tra transfer transitioning into pentamers. We have 65 pentamer observations where we uh, have just during the imaging lifetime uh, pentamer state. And then we have 11 observations where we see pentamers transitioning into tetramers, and we have six full uh, tetramer, pentamer, tetramer transitions. And from the latter two, we can uh, estimate the decay lifetime of the pentameric state to be about 190 seconds, so about three minutes. If we just calculate averages of all the uh, pentamer state um, observations uh, obviously limited due to the lifetime of the imaging in this kind uh, duration of the imaging we come to the same conclusion so we know the pentamer has a roughly only a lifetime of about three minutes and then it sheds a protomer again and becomes a tetramer so so far we know 
Pentamers are, are a rare state, about 10%. Pentamers have the same protrusion height as tetramers. Pentamers have similar but enlarged topography profile with a wider pore. Pentamers are in a dynamic equilibrium with tetramers through protomer exchange. And the protomer exchange is membrane diffusion dependent and therefore slow. And the slowness, obviously, uh, of the process makes it appear to have a very high energy barrier. And finally, we know that the pentamer is a transient state with a lifetime only of about three minutes. So then we were thinking in these ion channels, the ion conducting pore sits at the center of the um, oligomeric assembly. So if you uh, transit a, a square of the same so side length into a pentagon, obviously the in area increases by about a factor of 1.7. The in diameter by about a factor of 1.4, and the area of this diameter about uh, by a factor of 1.9. So this is a considerably enlarged pore, and this will have dramatic influence on uh, ion conductance, ion con selectivity, and so on and so on. And uh, we didn't know much what to do with it, and there comes in the big advantage for us that we I have good uh, friends in my uh, environment that are ion channel people and Krina said did you consider pore dilation and I did not know what pore dilation is so uh, what is the pore dilation phenomenon the pore dilation phenomenon has been described on the trip channel field uh, on trip v3 actually first by Michael Katarina's group and um, Michael Caterina was also the postdoc in David Julius's lab who discovered uh, the trip V1 channel. And what he described here for trip V3 is that upon uh, um, strong activation uh, of the channel by DPBA, which is a, um, an activator, you can see all of a sudden something strange happens and the channels become ter terribly conductive. These are whole, whole cell currents at plus and minus 80 millivolts. And what is even more surprising, as shown here, uh, more, or it's, it's also shown here, but it's very illustrative here. Uh, um, uh, when there's a temperature activation, so here are two, two times act, uh, brief, short activations to 45 degrees and then a long activation, you can see that there's this, this enhanced current happening. But more surprising is in the inward facing, uh, inward uh, rectified uh, current now completely matches uh, the current that is outgoing. So you can see what the ion channel uh, community calls rectification is that the ion flows better into one direction than in the other direction. This rectification entirely breaks down from a factor 4.5 to just one, so it, it becomes equally probable uh, for the ions, or equally easy for the ions to flow in both directions. He also showed on trip V1 that actually uh, these pores become um, permissive for the, um, for um, passage of very large ions like NMDG, TRIS, or 2MAE. And this is, as I said, is a very slow process, as you can see here also, and here, the x-axis is, is in seconds. So this process kicks in in the seconds to minutes time scale when until uh, it, it starts to kick in. So the portalated state is structurally and kinetically very different from a canonical open state. It has a substantially wider pore and it uh, occurs at uh, uh, unexpected slow and long time scales. And since then, uh, pore dilation has been described in the trip channel field on trip V3, trip V1, then trip V2 and trip V4 and trip A1. And uh, it has been nicely summarized by Xie Zheng in a, in a review where he says, can pore dilation in trip V1 and trip V3 be originated from the normal activity process? When capsaicin is used to activate trip V1, the open probability reaches a level that approaches unity. The activation kinetics is very fast, 
reaching stable levels in milliseconds compared to the seconds to minutes time scale for the development of pore dilation. It thus seems that pore dilation does not arise from the normal activation transitions, but rather represents a slow migration to a more stable open conformation. And this is a beautiful summary that comes entirely from uh, analyzing functional data that uh, indicates this uh, structural and kinetic difference of, uh, of pore dilated states with canonical open states. So we went then ahead and we copied the identical conditions that Michael Katarina used to uh, induce pore dilation in his cells. So we uh, supplied the high-speed AFM fluid cell with this activator, DPBA. And then we imaged the channels and we counted the pentamers. And we found that pentamers increased, the population increased by about a factor of twofold. But we also found which uh, obviously um, we have already partially seen before, is that the, the uh, number of fragments, meaning monomers, so here this is probably very well resolved the monomer. We didn't interpret uh, the fragments per se, but uh, this is this L-shaped here is probably a trimer. You can see dimers clearly. Um, so the number of fragments also increased. So this would implicate that the activation also produces fragments through an overactivation. Then the, the monomers can attack tetramers and insert to form the pentamers. So this would also predict that the activators actually destabilize the tetrameric uh, state of the trip channel. And we proved this using uh, the thermal denaturation measurements where we titrate the activator into the solution. And indeed, we can show uh, very nicely how uh, the transition temperatures and this uh, destabilization of the tetrameric uh, state occurs with a, a strong uh, um, activation of the channel. So now what do we know so far? The trip V3 pentamer has an enlarged pore. The pore dilation agent leads to destabilization of the tetramers. Pore dilation agent leads to increase in diffusive protomers. Pore dilation agent leads to an increase in the trip V3 pentamer population by about a factor of two. And this was our model then, is that the tetramers activated in the vaniloid binding site that is close at the interface between the voltage sensor-like domain of one subunit and the pore domain of the neighbor subunit. Oh, uh, and uh, strong activation favors the process of shedding a subunit and disassembly of tetramers. These protomers then attack tetramers to form pentamers. Pentamers shed uh, protomers again to revert to the canonical tetrameric state. So why has the pentameric trip V3 channel not been uh, discovered yet by cryo-EM? I told you that there's more than 130 trip V3 channels, uh, trip cha V channel structures available. And the problem is the following is that the transition to form a pentamer needs the 2D diffusion in a membrane. And what we do usually do is extract the, the, the channels. And once you have a tetrameric channel extracted and put into a detergent micelle or nanodisc, it cannot reconvert anymore into the pentameric state, even if you add the in principle correct agent. In addition, typical cryo -EM experiments are performed on samples that are purified and you select basically with using the peak of the size exclusion chromatography, the most abundant species. And then particle selection uh, even uh, again selects for particles that are most abundant and averaging processes do not help to determine rare states. So we profited from our knowledge from high-speed AFM, and we know from high-speed AFM three things. The pentameric state is reached through 2D membrane diffusion. The addition of the pore dilation agent increases the pentamer population, and pentamers are substantially larger than tetramers. So we took advantage from this uh, knowledge and adapted our protein uh, purification uh, method in this way that we added the activators before extracting the channels from membranes. 
Instead of using the size exclusion peak, we used the left shoulder of the size exclusion peak, and we used uh, modern uh, particle picking and classification methods to parse out rare states. So then we engaged into cryo-EM analysis, and this is a cryo-EM image of our sample, and this is the left shoulder of the size exclusion chromatogram that we analyzed. And we immediately were able to solve a 2.6 angstrom structure of the tetramer. This wasn't uh, what we hoped to do. But then we saw that there are single particles in these cryo EM images that clearly deviated from the tetrameric state and showed pentamer like structures. And we used these to get to nice 2D class averages. And from these 2D class averages, we succeeded to solve a 4.4 angstrom structure of the uh, pentameric trip V channel. And when you analyze now using whole the, the pore of these channels, it turned out that this channel has a seven fold wider pore than the closed tetramer and a 2.4 fold wider uh, selectivity filter than the open tetramer. Um, so this is just uh, the model building. Uh, so the conformational change that we are seeing if we align the tetramer and the pentamer subunit onto the tetramer structure on the pore helices, you can see that the whole domain, the whole protein, rest of the protein uh, flips out in a hinge motion. And this is this adaptation from a 90 degrees angle to a 108 degrees angle opening up space to accommodate the fifth subunit in the assembly. This, so from high-speed AFM, we know that the pentameric state is entering is slow through insertion of membrane diffusive protomers into the tetramer to form a pentamer as nicely imaged in this movie, and that the pentamer lifetime is short, just about three minutes before they decay into pet. Ten, uh, tetramers again. From cryoium, we know that the pentamer has about 2.4 fold wider pore than a canonical tetrameric open state, and that it is an 18 degrees hinge motion of the, all the rest of the protein with respect to the pore domain that allows uh, an opening. And this brings us to this uh, simple model, actually, where uh, we postulate that activation of the channels in this uh, in this at this interface between pore domain and voltage sensor like domain leads to flipping all, over up uh, of this uh, voltage sensor like domain and membrane diffusive monomers can attack this interface here satisfy this interface and then their own voltage sensor like domain will um, anneal with the pore domain of the next subunit, and that's how you form a pentamer rather easily. So as a summary, high-speed AFM discovered a pentameric trip V3 channel state that eluded 10 years of trip V uh, cryo-electron microscopy. The pentameric uh, uh, channel have kinetic and structural signatures reminiscent of what has functionally been described for pore dilation and therefore likely represents the structural correlate of pore dilation. And finally, high-speed AFM discovered membrane diffusive exchange of protomers as a novel way of structural and functional plasticity of membrane proteins. And we propose that this may also happen in other uh, channel families. And with this, I would like to thank you. And as you may have seen, the pentamer has always been there. We just haven't seen it yet because of all the other tetramers. And uh, I like to thank to you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Simon. That was amazing. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll start with some questions. So I guess the the immediate thing that comes to my mind is, you know, what is it now about how you're doing these experiments that allows you to see these things, specifics, let's say, to the high-speed AFM or what resolution you can get? Can you comment yeah. a bit more on that? Yeah, it will be. It's my pleasure to, to do that. Obviously, um, it is, number one, it's the single molecule uh, visualization uh, capability of high-speed AFM. So the, the trump card is the signal-to-noise ratio. So the fact that we can actually look at these molecules 
And uh, in some ways, it has been an accidental finding that it's just in your face. There is a pentamer. And uh, then we started to, to, to ask the question what it means. Uh, is obviously the trump card of the technology. The resolution must be good enough to resolve unambiguously uh, subunits. And now obviously comes the dynamic aspect of the imaging in is that since this uh, uh, molecule has a lifetime of about three minutes, uh, let's say when I was a, a postdoc or uh, then uh, taking an AFM image still took five to 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, when you scan so slow, obviously these states, these states decay while you're basically taking an image uh, you can imagine that like uh, in electrophysiology, if you have a very low bandwidth uh, and and uh, you would have very short opening blips of an ion channel opening, but you average these out uh, because simply your acquisition method is not fast enough to resolve these openings, right? In this case, it's the imaging acquisition speed must be obviously significantly faster than the lifetime of the state. And this is where uh, the high-speed AFM um, was a trump card. And then obviously the fact then combined to that, that we were then actually <laughs> able to, to, to understand, to show the reversibility, the insertion of protomers into the tetramer, uh, showing reversibility is, is in my view, the strongest argument and obviously it gives you a, also a direct access to the mechanism how it happens right the, otherwise you you would ask have is is this just something that that happened uh initially or something like, uh, you know but this is clearly in a dynamic equilibrium uh between tetramers and pentamers and for this you need dynamic imaging and that goes on sort of with time so as you're wa watching your sample over time Yes. How, yeah, how you can see that this is continuing to initiate. So it's not just, the, as you said, we're just there at the beginning. It's, yes. It's continuing to occur. Absolutely. Absolutely. In, in our initial samples, we, 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 we also reconstituted actually proteins from the peak of the size exclusion. We did exactly the same thing as every structural biologist. It's the fact that we put them back into membranes and then watched them over ex extended period of time. And then the molecules started to repopulate the rare state. I have no doubt that our initial sample preparation was almost 100% tetramers. Mm, and then it, it changed. It, and then it started to to mix again and, and, and the process to happen. Wonderful. I'll take I'll take one more question here from Jose Maria Delfino. Um, do you actually need a membrane like platform to allow for subunit addition in a micelle? Would this be forbidden or diminished? Yes, I I believe that it needs the mem 2D membrane diffusion. I don't think that in a micelle you could have um, um, one protomer leaving a tetramer and go out, take take significant amount of detergent out, being a monomer in solution in, uh, for a while. Uh, I think that the micelle is is in itself a a stable, isolated object and uh, then uh, that 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 monomer would fuse with another micelle uh, in in a meaningful way i i don't think this is this is going to happen i am convinced you need the membrane uh, and 2d membrane diffusion for this to uh, protomer insertion to happen okay i'm going to take one more question and then uh, please do continue to put questions into the chat because I think um, there's lots more to discuss here, but we'll mm -hmm. come back to some of this. So uh, from Lucio Luzzato, is the monomer monomer interface the same in the tetramer versus in the pentamer? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. Um, <laughs> the problem is that our Pentamer structure at the moment is 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 not sufficient to to resolve all residues. Uh, in that slide that I went very quickly over, uh, is is uh, we only resolve thirty nine percent of the side chains in the pentamer at this stage in uh, of our research. 
and especially uh, those interfaces obviously these are the most important ones so we want to know which interfaces have disappeared and with which have uh, changed overall overall it's the same it's still a domain swap we have the hinge motion uh, that that opens up um, i would expect that there are um, significant changes of the interface and it is our hope to um, to find these differences and describe them at higher resolution so that we fa can find compounds that stabilize one or the other state. But we are not entirely there yet. But that is actually a very good point. We need to get there, yeah. I think that may come up as we have our, our further discussions here, sort of the technical parts as well as, you know, these systems, how we can, how we can advance further. So uh, thank you again, Simon. That was well, wonderful. I think now, uh, George, if you could. I stop sharing. Yep. How can uh, I stop? Says that George has started screen sharing. I don't see it yet. There we go. Yep. Oh, okay. See it, George? Perfect. I don't see you yet. There you are. I see you. Perfect. Sorry, starting to hit the buttons. Okay. okay, I'll leave it with you. Take it away, George. Okay, great. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Simon for the, the opportunity to, to speak at this uh, great webinar. Um, a lot of the techniques that I'll be talking about uh, were developed whilst I was a postdoc in Simon's lab. Um, but now as an independent, we continue to try and push those even further. Um, so I'm mainly going to be talking about kind of software and method developments, not so much on the, the hardware of the high-speed AFM itself. Um, and to begin with, um, Simon just mentioned previously um, how it does take about five minutes to capture a standard AFM image. Uh, and I think this is probably one of his images from his postdoc years that he mentioned. Um, this is sped up five times. So it, it misses the the dynamics, um, but you can still get that very high spatial resolution. And <clears throat> um, with the great advances to high-speed AFM, uh, we can see lots of new interesting protein dynamics. For example, what Simon has just shown. Um, one of the first breakthrough uh, pieces of work that really got my interest in high-speed AFM over 10 years ago now is this um, famous movie of actin um, of myosin 5 walking along an actin filament uh, where they can start to see some individual conformational changes on the on the feet of the uh, myosin heads. Um, but the question is, how fast can we go? Uh, how fast will the hardware get to in the next few years? Um, current thoughts and opinions are suggesting that at the moment we can go around 50 frames per second if we're pushing it, uh, at maybe some resolution loss. Um, and that might reach 100 frames per second, I've heard. Uh, and But that might be in a few years. Um, and pushing beyond that, I think progress may be relatively incremental, although very important. Um, and if we think about protein dynamics, uh, these are very rough estimates of how quickly we have things like conformational changes. So they can range from the seconds right down to the microsecond timescales. Uh, diffusion depends on how fast it's diffusing, whether you can actually see it. Uh, things like domain motions, that's more in the millisecond and um, faster timescales and things like channel gating are really kind of just beyond reach or just about within reach of high-speed AFM. But uh, if we can go faster, then obviously we can start uh, measuring these um, better. So in my talk, firstly, I'll talk about pushing the temporal resolution with some methods. Uh, I'll then talk about pushing the spatial resolution uh, with a super resolution like technique. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about a new um, AFM analysis platform, which hopes to help enhance this kind of spatial resolution and allow other people to apply this technique. So standard AFM imaging, you have to rest the scan a tip all the way across the sample building the image up line by line. Uh, and obviously this takes time. Um, one way to get a, a quick uh, 
uh, and very easy increase in time resolution is to line scan. So instead of scanning across the whole surface, uh, you pick a line of interest, uh, which could be a particular protein or a part of a protein, <clears throat> and just scan repeatedly over that uh, region um, line by line to produce chymographs. Uh, and we, we demonstrated this very nicely on a, a transporter. This is GLTPH. Uh, you can see the three subunits of the GLTPH here. Uh, and it transports with a, an elevator type mechanism where one of the subunits um, collects its cargo, uh, moves across the membrane, well, kind of elevator movement to the other side where it releases uh, that cargo across the membrane. Um, and with this line scanning chymograph, we can see the time points when it's up, uh, and then there'll be a dark region, uh, that's when it's gone down, uh, and then this is popping up and down, uh, and we're getting this with millisecond time resolution. So we can get out very high speed kinetics uh, that aren't really visible by other techniques. So we can get the spatial information as well as the temporal information here. Uh, and interestingly, we could see an intermediate state, which wasn't resolved before, um, where the transporter is kind of halfway down. Uh, and with that information, you can start to think about different pathways of whether it's going from down to middle, back to down, or whether it's going right across, uh, and how that might depend on what cargo it's carrying. Uh, and to push the time resolution even further, you can completely stop scanning, still have the AFM tip oscillating um, at kind of 600 uh, kilohertz, uh, and you can get microsecond, 10 microsecond time resolution here. Uh, so it's somewhat limited by how often you're tapping, but also by how quickly the feedback loop of the AFM can uh, respond to those changes. Uh, and you can see we're demonstrating this here on a, an ion channel. So this is OMPG. Um, and you've parked the tip right on top of where um, the channel opens and closes. Uh, and then there's this loop which pops in and out. Um, we can see that nicely in the, the height trace over time. So we don't get images anymore. We get uh, just the Z or the vertical height and how that changes over time, uh, but a very high time resolution. Uh, and our noise level is around one angstrom. Um, so you can see that in the data, the scale is from minus two angstrom to plus four angstrom. Uh, and we can see this kind of two and a half to three angstrom change in height uh, as this loop is popping in and out. And we can not only use this to look at <clears throat> an individual protein dynamics, um, we can use it to look at protein diffusion. So uh, our time resolution, as I said, is limited by the, the Z response time, which is around 10 microseconds. Um, and it can be used in combination with imaging. So we can image a sample and then quickly change this spectroscopy mode uh, to get the dynamics at a point of interest. Um, <clears throat> And if we have lots of molecules diffusing, so mica is the standard substrate that we would use for AFM, so it should just be atomically fat, a uh, bit of background noise, but no real dynamics. However, if we have the tip on top of a membrane uh, with proteins diffusing around, we get all these uh, spikes. So each one of these spikes corresponds to a, a diffusion event underneath the tip. So <clears throat> kind of like a, a nano fluorescence correlation spectroscopy um, where we're not detecting labels, we're detecting heights, uh, and we have some spatial uh, information there as well. Uh, and our detection spot is typically smaller than the molecule of interest itself, so we can use it in interesting ways. Uh, to go into a bit more detail about that uh, diffusing system, uh, so this is an XN5 assembling on uh, lipid membranes. So we have a, a membrane to begin with. Uh, we release some calcium using uh, UV illumination. So the calcium is originally caged. Uh, and you can see in imaging mode, uh, it gets very blurry and messy. And eventually, there's a, a lattice that forms on uh, on top of the membrane. Uh, and this has been thought to be important in cell membrane repair. So if there's a, a rupture in a cell membrane, uh, there would be a flux of calcium in. Uh, and then this annexin protein binds to PS lipids in the presence of calcium. Uh, and it's thought that this assembly might help that. Uh, 
So we can do our, our height spectroscopy. So apart from the tip on top of the membrane, normally in the center, this image is taken before, this video is taken before. Uh, and when we have an X in, in solution, uh, but no calcium, we just get a nice background signal uh, with a noise level of around one angstrom. Uh, as we start to increase the, the calcium concentration, we start to see more and more spikes. And we can measure that they just look as a single line here, but we can measure the real width of each of those uh, and get dwell time distributions, uh, which here are around 50-ish microseconds. Um, and as we increase the calcium concentration in the images, we see more and more spikes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and in the spectroscopy data, the density of those spikes increases, suggesting that we have a higher concentration on the surface. Um, but not only a higher concentration, the dwell time distribution shifts as well. So each of those uh, spikes is actually getting longer, or there's a, an extra distribution of longer dwell times. Uh, and eventually, when there's enough calcium there, uh, the lattice starts forming, and the, you get these very long dwell times, which could be uh, a whole crystal underneath the tip at any moment. Uh, and the dwell time gets really stretched out. Uh, and if we think about what we're actually measuring here, uh, we've got our detection spot. This is shown as a little spot here, but it's really the, the very end of the tip. Uh, and if you have molecules diffusing under there, that dwell time is not going to only depend on the diffusion coefficient, but also the size of the molecule. Um, a bigger lateral size is going to take longer to uh, travel under the tip. Uh, and we can actually separate our data out into uh, fractions of monomer, dimer, trimer, uh, and so on. It gets a bit more difficult as we get up to higher order oligomers. Um, uh, and measure the diffusion coefficient and look at how that compares to what we'd expect for increasing size. Um, uh, and this is just showing how we can fit the data to all those different dwell time distributions um, at low concentration, lots of short peaks. At higher concentrations, there's a, a fraction of um, longer peaks uh, and so on up to higher concentrations. So as I mentioned, this uh, is useful for understanding protein-protein interactions if they're too fast to image uh, with high-speed AFM. Uh, and we can also use it for conformational dynamics, um, which I showed kind of at the start there, where um, the images would look like this. This is a single omp G here. Um, looks very noisy. Let me play that again. Um, and then we try to park the tip on the very um, center of this. Uh, and if we're lucky and if we hit the right spot, then we get these nice bimodal uh, changes going from open to closed. Um, and that matches with what we'd expect to see. So I'll move on to the, the spatial resolution next. Uh, and I like to use this example of uh, a blindfolded person uh, using a tip uh, to feel around. Um, and if you were to scan this tip, this is effectively your AFM tip, uh, you would not be able to detect the spikes uh, because of tip convolution. Um, and your resolution is mostly limited by the sharpness of that tip. Um, so you would think it's the same as the, the rough ground before, uh, and you would step on the spikes. Uh, and with an AFM tip, uh, we're not measuring spikes, but or measuring features. Uh, and the sharpness of this can get down to atomic resolution, but it doesn't really stay that sharp for long. Um, and averagely, average tip radius might be two nanometers uh, or down to one nanometer if we're lucky. Um, and one method to improve resolution might be just to average across multiple AFM images. Uh, and that does remove background noise, but we still have the tip convoluted surface. Um, so there's not a huge increase in, in real resolution. Uh, and you can demonstrate this with uh, some simulations. So if we perform an AFM simulation of the, the tip convolution uh, using the, the 3D coordinates of any uh, protein from the protein data bank, um, we can see that as you increase the tip radius, um, the structure becomes more and more blurred and stretched outwards, but also 
individual features are kind of missing. Um, and if you take, take pixel sampling into account, uh, the problem becomes even more clear. Uh, and then when you add a bit of noise, this is only one angstrom noise, uh, the problem is even more evident. So we're going from a atomic sharp tip all the way up to a two nanometer tip here. Um, and so <clears throat> on the right here, we have the kind of actual sampling and noise that we might get with a very sharp tip, um, a one nanometer tip. And the question is how much information can we recover from movies or multiple particles uh, like this uh, compared to the real uh, crystal structure. And so we turn to kind of super resolution principles um, developed for techniques like STORM and PARM, uh, where they have fluorescent signals which are no longer all at once. Um, you temporarily separate them. So you have one fluorophore shining in one particular region at a time which allows you to, to localize the initial position of that uh, with much higher precision than if they're all fluorescing at the same time so that you can reconstruct uh, a super resolution image over time. However, we don't have any fluorescence in our system uh, and we don't want to be limited by fluorescent tags either. So we have a surface, uh, we have, this is a model topography uh, just for demonstration uh, and the height profile is very flat. However, if you have these features uh, fluctuating with thermal fluctuations, you can see that over time, some regions are higher than others uh, and we can localize those regions, not always with 100% accuracy, sometimes we localize in between, uh, but if we do that over time, over enough images, uh, we can reconstruct a super resolution image, uh, just like uh, in single molecule localization microscopy. Uh, and this is what we refer to as localization AFM. Uh, we can take a closer look at this simulated image uh, compared to an averaged image uh, and also compared to the standard deviation because there's fluctuations going on here. So you might think, let's uh, see the standard deviation and how that compares. Uh, and you do get stronger signal at the edges particularly and maybe some signal in the middle, but the, the localization AFM pinpoints all five of these uh, features very well. Uh, and we can apply that to real data. Uh, so this is um, taken on standard AFM. These are multiple uh, particles of aquapora and Z, uh, and we can build up a localization map. Uh, this is with 128 frames, uh, which is close to the kind of minimum that is uh, required uh, to build up enough localizations. And we can see we get a very high <clears throat> resolution image of the top surface of uh, the aquapora and Z. Uh, and we can compare that to the, the crystal structure uh, shown in kind of surface uh, map here uh, and compare that back to the best average we could create uh, with AFM. Uh, and we can do this on lots of different systems. Um, so we've done it with some annexin. This is the lattice molecule that I showed previously. Uh, and compare it to the crystal structure uh, and see that we're getting lots of high resolution information. We can also do it with proteins that um, have less well-known conformational changes. So this is a, an antiporter, CLC, um, and it, some techniques, so X-ray crystallography suggested that there was no real large conformational changes uh, during its um, transport, uh, whereas NMR suggested there's some large conformational changes changes uh, and this is a, a pH sensitive antiparter. Uh, and with the, the high speed AFM and the localization AFM analysis, we could see it at two different pHs, there's a significant conformational change where these uh, top regions here come together uh, and this is kind of an opening over this region, which is actually the, the iron pathway. Uh, and we can start to think about how these changes at the top surface might translate to the, the transmembrane helices. Uh, and we can also do this on the OMPG data. So we have a movie of the, the loop going in and out. So we can separate all the closed like conformations with the open. Uh, and this movie is showing a morph between the most open LAFM map compared to the most closed uh, localization AFM map. Uh, and it really does match quite nicely with where that loop 
uh, is expected to be moving from uh, um, to into the, the hole. So that was the improvement in spatial uh, resolution. Uh, with high-speed AFM, we get a, a huge amount of data. Um, if we're imaging at 11 frames per second or 50 frames per second, uh, and the data is quite complex just to interpret with standard tools. Um, so we might be getting 25 million pixels per minute, uh, and analysis can be quite long. Uh, we can spend more time analyzing the data than collecting it, if, assuming that the delay the data that you collect is good. Um, and we're also hindered by things like format issues. So different AFMs have different file formats, which may or may not be openable by uh, existing tools. Um, there are some very powerful tools for kind of standard slow AFMs, such as the Gridian. Uh, there's ImageJ, which is more geared, to, I would say, to more general image analysis, but maybe fluorescence image analysis. Uh, and then we have the manufacturer software, which um, only goes so far in terms of detailed analysis. Uh, and then there are lots of nice image analysis tools being developed uh, across lots of different microscopies that we might also like to use. Um, so to improve this and to help kind of aid the improvement of resolution in AFM, we've developed um, a software called Nanolux, uh, which aims to read in any raw AFM data from any high-speed AFM, um, allow lots of different single particle detection, particle alignment, drift correction, um, integration of simulations, uh, and hopefully output localization analysis, single particle analysis uh, in a very fast and high throughput way. Um, and I won't leave this up for long. So there's lots of different file types that we can open at the moment and try to expand on this. Uh, we can read different channels um, and treat all our AFM data as movies. And this is a very quick preview of the, the graphical user interface at the moment, uh, which is constantly being updated, but this is kind of the, the basis of it. Um, and performing kind of automatic image alignment leveling. Uh, so the raw data in AFM is often tilted and quite messy, and it takes a bit of time to do the leveling. Uh, but we can do that in an automated way across whole videos uh, and in the future, maybe across all days with the um, data capture. And this is the, the particle detection happening now. Um, this is just an example using DNA origami, not proteins, but um, it's a nice example because it's a nice little square. Um, so we detected all those particles and we can do some rotational and translational alignment. Um, and eventually, improve out, this is the average on the right hand side here, improve the average and uh, then perform localization AFM analysis in an interactive way, a way that we can make it as easy as possible for other people to apply um, and apply things like this has fourfold symmetry so we can apply that symmetry to, to improve our signal to noise uh, and get out a nice high resolution image at the end. Um, <clears throat> So I didn't show it in that particular movie, but we can think about increasing our, our data. So AFM, often we scan in one direction and maybe throw away the, the, the other direction data. Uh, we can combine that data in the software, uh, make use of as much data as there is, um, apply the leveling, detect the positions uh, with a template. Uh, and in this case, we can track the positions so that we can separate out particle one and particle two here uh, and do true single particle localization AFM uh, and compare particle one with particle two. You can see here there's some defects in one which don't exist in the other. Uh, and yeah. Uh, another feature that we can do is incorporate the, the simulation AFM. So if we have a known PDB structure, we can do a simulation of that and use that as our template to scan our data, do the particle picking. Um, uh, and at the same time, if we have enough frames or particles, uh, we can start to think about doing time resolved localization AFM. Um, it needs a certain number of frames, like 
I'd say at least 100, which is what we've shown here, um, and 100 particles. Um, and so our time resolution does decrease by that factor, unless you have multiple particles, and then you can average across them. Um, and you can see here it gets quite far uh, as the signal uh, reduces over time. OK, uh, so I'll finish there um, and just summarize uh, that the height spectroscopy method allows us to get 10 microsecond resolution on single points. Uh, the localization method allows us to get four angstrom resolution. Uh, and the Nanolock software <clears throat> should make this localization AFM analysis automated uh, and allow us to improve the method even more in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, there are links here for the software uh, and PhD positions. Uh, uh, and thank my, my group, uh, Simon Schuring and this group, uh, and you for your attention. Thank you very much, George. That's amazing the, the, to me that uh, this is how far it's come along. I guess I'll, le I'll start with a question. Clearly all these data, uh, processing them and interpreting them is a big challenge. And so there's these many advances. Can you comment on where you think that's at and what you expect may may happen next? I mean, do you just need, yeah, what, what needs to happen next? And also a specific thing I was wondering about is bridging timescales, right? In these different methods, you have different timescales possible. To me, that's kind of a holy grail is how do you bring them all together? It's a big picture question. So first, the more specific. Yeah, <laughs> in terms of the uh, the software, I think we AFM is maybe behind uh, other techniques like cryo EM and super resolution microscopy, but I think uh, we should start to catch up. Uh, and hopefully, I mean they've had their resolution revolutions, uh, and I think we might be able to achieve something like that uh, in the future. And this is maybe the beginning of that. The localization AFM. Um, could be the start of that, but it does need good software, uh, and many people are starting to work on the kind of software side of bio AFM a lot more. I think um, seems to me it's just begging to happen, right? It's just you need. To... I remember when with solid state NMR and things like this, right? When people were first just trying these things, and uh, Robert Tico was saying, "We just need more people to do this, right? To drive it forward." It's it's knowing the potential and then actually just realizing it that's what it seems to me i think it's really exciting and yeah. um second question i've already forgotten sorry. bridging the time scales, bridging the time scales. So from the microseconds to the milliseconds how do you envisage can can you do this or is that possible to think about yet yeah i mean with the, the three different techniques we kind of do bridge down to the, the microsecond so you can do the the 3D imaging, which gets you a certain window, and then the, the line scanning, which gets you down to the millisecond, and then mm -hmm. the point scanning or the height spectroscopy gets you down to that fastest. Um, and we might think about trying to not just do that at a single point, but kind of map out dynamics uh, and then bridge across that way. There's also the bridging down to kind of MD simulations, which I think we're getting close to. Um, depending on the complexity of the simulation. Um, but they will always be able to push more and more towards our timescales, and hopefully we can push more down to their timescales and, uh, and make a nice bridge that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to note that for those in the audience, um, Simon was answering questions, so both orally and uh, in, in written form. And so those have moved in the chat to the answered session, uh, session and you can do the same uh, as we continue through the webinar. Um, and you can type your questions at any time in the, in the question, in the Q&A that's at the, on your screen. Um, I have one really specific question. So this is one of my interests, which is uh, with your... CLC, your pH sensitive antiporter. It looked to me as I was looking at the images. So this again goes to function and getting at these different potential dynamics and time scales. I wondered if open and closed looked quite different in terms of their dynamics and whether you could see that. Um, 
we never went into that much detail. I think well, I think with the CLC at one pH it's active and at the other it's kind of locked. Um ideally we'd be able to get enough data to be able to see all the locked ones and what confirmation they're in versus the dynamic and in the dynamic data pick out the two confirmations. Um <clears throat> But I think we never got enough high resolution data to be able to get that. Um, they were also, from memory, quite fragile. So the mm. dimer would, at different pHs, break apart. I think at the, I think it was the higher pH where imaging it, you would get a certain number of images, but eventually after maybe a hundred images, it might uh, break into monomers, not not break apart completely, just dissociate. Um, and, yeah. and that might be meaningful, right? That yeah. might tell you something about the state of the thing. Yeah, there could be lots more to, to actually do on that system. Um, oh, Simon, you are muted. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'm very impressed. Okay, so in the interest of staying on target, we'll we'll stop there. Um, and switch now to Takayuki, our third presenter, and then we'll have a general discussion at the end. Yep, I see your presentation. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. Okay, take it away. Okay, uh, I have Takayuki just from Nama University. Uh, first, oh. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Simon and Professor Mayoring for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak, uh, talk about uh, uh, my study at this webinar. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce uh, observation wind shift HPCs as one of the applications of high speed data in protein imaging. Since the uh, development of high speed AFM, HPLCs have uh, occupied an uh, uh, important position at application target like uh, member proteins because HPLCs is a large group of proteins that are ubiquitous in cells and have various functions, making them a significant position in protein science. In addition, uh, especially for HPLCs that works or to act as a molecular motor, their coefficient dynamics directly link to their molecular function. Uh, moreover, in the pro practical aspect, the HPAs is allow for controlling the frequency of structure, structure changes based on ATP concentration, uh, enabling adjustment of, to, to match the time resolution of high speed FM. So, in this regard, the ATPs motors have been a primary target for the initial application of high speed FM. I think a groundbreaking study in this field was observation of the linear molecular motor. Marshall 5 by uh, Professor Anders Group in Kansas University. So this work effectively demonstrated the ability of high speed vision to observe protein dynamics like this. So since the uh, beginning of my research with the high speed vision, I have uh, been observing various hexamic HPSs. So today I I'm going to present an early application of high speed vision in which uh, confusion dynamics were uh, observed on rotary motor protein and the recent uh, application of the ring shaped ATPAs. So as you know, uh, F1 ATPAs is a soluble component of ATP synthesis, comprising the ring shaped hexamer in which the gamma uh, subunit inserted into the, the uh, pore of the hexamer ring. So it's well known that this gamma subunit rotates uh, counterclockwise in the stator due to ATP hydrolysis. So this Rotational rotation motion is driven by the structure change in the ring shaped uh, complex composed two uh, subunits, alpha and beta. Uh, initially, I attempted to, to observe the structure, ch structure change of the complex with uh, this gamma uh, subunit with high speed using high speed FM. Uh, this is a typical FM image of FM PPS with gamma subunit. But you know, the conversion effect caused by the protruding uh, axe gamma subunit and the shape of FM probe uh, obscures the observation of the subunit structure. 
due to the conversion, like uh, George uh, mentioned. So however, when the, uh, this gamma salient is accidentally removed by AFM probe, the AFM image clearly shows the salient structure in the ring, revealing the, uh, uh, that the hexameric structure is asymmetric. For holding this, we intentionally prepared uh, an axle S F1 ATPS. I mean, uh, we, we uh, removed gamma subunit and you see uh, observed convection dynamics in the hexagonal uh, hexagonal directory like this. So through this approach, we confound the uh, three uh, of the beta subunit switch between the open and the closed state as previously known by the crystal structure. Also, it was confirmed that this structure change, the frequency of this conclusion uh, change, uh, uh, is indeed caused by ATP hydrosis. Furthermore, we are, are able to observe how these structure change propagate among the subunit. So this observation proved that cooperative catalytic activity within hexamic ring can function even in the absence of the gamma subunit. So furthermore, a notable feature of AFM is its mechanical contact with the sample through the probe. So this arose, uh, arose for, for the forced removal of one of the cell unit in the hexagon by applying ex external holes uh, from the AFM probe. So we observed that the cooperative structure change uh, rust when either beta sub into rust, here yeah, beta sub is lost, after removal of beta cell unit, this uh, uh, cut, uh, cooperative coefficient change is completely lost. And also, if we removed alpha sub unit in the hexagon rib, uh, in this case, also the cooperative, cooperative slope change is uh, completely lost. So this example highlights the versatility of AFM, not only in observing molecular structure, but also in, in manipulating the local structure. So the rotational propagation of structure change observed in the hexameric ATPs can also be in, in seen in, in V-type ATPs as a kind of rotational uh, molecular motor. Uh, also, F1, F and V-type ATPs have similar structures. So they, their physiological functions are entirely different. So, you know, F4, F1 functions as an ATP synthesis driven by proton motive holes. Uh, in, uh, on the other hand, V or V1 act as a sodium or a proton ion pump across the cell membrane, driven by ATP hydrolysis. So single molecule uh, optical uh, imaging uh, measurement uh, have shown that this uh, uh, axle rotates in counterclockwise direct, counter direction similar to F1 ATPs. So as observing the axle race V1 ATPs with high speed FM. So we can see the three bright spots. And this, uh, this uh, three, uh, the reason why we observe only three spots in hexama is uh, the A subunit is uh, much larger than the uh, uh, B subunit. That's why we can see the primary, we can see three, uh, three uh, bright spots. And uh, also, interestingly, when the D subunit uh, serving as axle was introduced into the observation solution, we could observe that the T subunit uh, spontaneously inter inserted into the uh, uh, pore of the hexamic ring, like this. Okay, so uh, the crystal structure of the V1 ATPs has revealed that uh, this A3 uh, B3 complex has an asymmetric structure upon the nucleotide binding. So uh, the soothed FM image created, simulated based on the crystal structure indicate that this asymmetric, uh, asymmetry can potentially be identified in FM image like this. Okay? So this uh, A subunit is distanced from the other two subunits. So actually we put this asymmetric structure uh, in the actual FM image. So, Crystallographic analysis suggests that ATP binding and structure change in the A3B3 complex propagate uh, rotational like this. 
So in this uh, high uh, movie, the stroke change of S7 uh, visualized uh, particularly the transition of the empty state A subunit moving counterclockwise uh, similar to this uh, crystal structure. So additionally, we confirmed when ATP concentration is increased, the propagation of structure change uh, becomes faster. However, compared to the F1 ATPs, more instances of reverse rotation like this, uh, observed in B-type ATPs, which may indicate a uh, uh, weaker cooperativity with the hexamic link. Okay, so next I, I briefly show an uh, example of observing confessional dynamics in inherent ring-shaped ATPs, focusing on ABO1. ABO1 is a, a, a chaperone essential for assembly nucleus in fission yeast depositing a histone onto the DNA in an ATP hydrostipendent manner. The cry em analysis uh, has revealed nucleotide-dependent structures, suggesting uh, that in the ATP-bound state, ABO1 adopts an asymmetric uh, spiral structure, while ADP and APO state, it assumes a symmetric ring structure. So it will be interesting to see if this ring structure is inherently uh, cooperative in its structure change. So under the presence of ATP, uh, the ring increased flexibility at the broken segment. Uh, 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 and the, in the broken segment, the corresponding sound seem to be to be lost in the echo image like this. Okay? And the structure change in this ring uh, uh, quite round down. Uh, we couldn't see any apparent sequential pro propagation in, in the ring. So this uh, indicates, so uh, in case of F type or V type ATPs, which is rotary motor protein, uh, but uh, in the case of just uh, uh, hexamic uh, ring shaped ATPs, we can't uh, see the uh, sequential, uh, co any cooperativity in, in the uh, ATP uh, hydrolysis. In the last, I present another example for, for ring-shaped ATPs that induce uh, global structure changes focusing on uh, di uh, disaggregation chaperon, uh, CUPB. CUPB is a member of a triple protein family, and uh, uh, its function is a rescue of functional protein from aggregated state in the cooperation with cofactors, which are uh, in heat shock protein 70 classes. So CLPB has two uh, uh, nucleotide binding domain, triple A1 and triple A2, and unique uh, coiled coil region extending from the, its main body, known as a uh, middle domain. And extensive structure and biochemical studies have revealed that the middle domain is essential for the unique disaggregation capability, uh, changing its conformation during ATP hydrolysis. So furthermore, the upper part of the A triple uh, A domain uh, contains uh, an A terminal tail like domain, which is not considered essential for its uh, disaggregation activity. Uh, CAPB assembled into the homohexamic ring and is known to uh, operate based on so called poor uh, threading mode model, where the ring facilitates the passage of aggregate proteins through its uh, central pole. So this uh, poor threading model is based on the assumption that the ring is symmetric and stable like this. As shown in this uh, image, in e e electron microscopy analysis in 2000, demonstrated that CAPB is a stable hexagon. Uh, it has also been considered that the poor size and, uh, and the conformation of middle domain uh, uh, undergoes nucleotide-dependent changes. However, recent developments in single particle analysis technique in quiet uh, microscopy have revealed that both uh, heat shock protein 14 and CAPB don't have a symmetry ring structure, but rather have spiral structures like this. And this led to the proposal of the ratchet like peptide translocation mechanism, where the spiral structure propagates rotationally. So our high-speed observation of CAPB uh, commerced before this spiral model was proposed. 
So actually, I expect to see a ring structure and the copal to coefficient change of the middle domain in the ring. So uh, we observed CUPB derived from uh, some of some fuels due to its uh, comparatively stable structure at room temperature. And as the uh, end domain is not essential for this distribution activity and could potentially interfere the FA imaging to, to see the uh, hexagon ring structure. So we used uh, L terminal truncated CUPB. So this is a typical FA image of CUPB oligomers observed in the presence of ATP. From this image, so you see it's clear that the oligomer structure is not homogeneous. So we classify the typical structure into four categories. One is uh, it's like a worm-like structure, which seems to be composed of six or seven subunit and appears to be an open ring, which inter-subunit con connection in the oligomer is completely disrupted. Additionally, uh, some symmetric shaped hexameric oligomer are visible. But the most common are the, these asymmetric and distorted ring. These asymmetric rings are fundamentally hexamer with, uh, with one or two uh, protrusion uh, uh, in the, uh, this uh, ring structure. So particularly the asymmetric ring structure closely resembles uh, resemble the pseudo image are created from, from the spiral structure resolved by cryo So on the other hand, this unique structure, which could be termed a, a twisted half spiral home, resembling the uh, fusion of three subunit was also observed. In the snapshot oligomers, the uh, two representative states of Closed and openings are distinguished by measuring circularity like this. So histogram of this circularity at different ATP concentrations clearly showed two peaks with lower and higher peaks corresponding the uh, open and closed ring respectively. Uh, splitting the histogram by a uh, uh, circularity threshold, uh, relative frequency of these two states was estimated, uh, uh, indicating uh, ATP concentration dependence like this. Okay. The increase in the relative frequency of the closed ring as a function of ATP concentration concentration can be fitted to a simple one-to-one -one binding model with an apparent uh, KD of uh, uh, 10 micromolar. Uh, closely matching the apparent KD values of ATP binding to the wild type uh, CAPB estimated for biochemical assay. It's in the case of ATP gamma S, uh, the relative frequency of closed rings reached to nearly uh, 70%, but significant decreased to about 30% in the presence of ADP. Furthermore, under ADP conditions, most, uh, most uh, uh, closed rings uh, were uh, asymmetric type. So these results suggest that ATP binding to CAPB induced the formation of the hexamic rings and the symmetry rings deform in upper or under ATP state, leading to the symmetry asymmetry transition in the hexamer. Actually, in the absence of ATP incubation, we have only amorphous uh, structures observed. However, upon the addition of ATP uh, during the imaging, see, ring structure appeared during the imaging. You see the uh, ring structure gradually uh, appeared during the imaging. So on the other hand, also the ring structure was seen in, uh, after the ATP incubation, uh, but in ATP depleted condition, the number of ring structure gradually decreased. This, okay. So during imaging, so this uh, number of ring structure gradually decreased in the uh, without ATP, uh, ATP in the uh, observation solution. So additionally, under uh, high ATP concentrator conditions, uh, subunit shuffling was frequently observed like this. So several subunits dissociated from the ring 
but uh, then re reassembled or dissociated subunit form the link with other subunit. So this indicates that CAPB oligomers are highly flexible and unstable. So here the typical movies of CAPB observed at different ATP con concentration. So at low ATP concentrations, uh, the ring shape doesn't change so much. But at higher ATP concentrations, the ring shape drastically fluctuates. Uh, I mean, the ring shape change uh, transient transit between the symmetric and the asymmetric structure. So to evaluate whether the structural transition between symmetric and asymmetric form is caused by ATP hydrolysis, we, we analyze the time course of these uh, 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 two oligomers depending on ATP concentration. For this purpose, we sought an object, objective uh, criterion to semi-automatically identify symmetric and asymmetric types in the FM image. So we found uh, that the variation in the standard deviation of the height around the uh, cross section of the ring structure provides a good criterion between for to 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 distinguish uh, uh, symmetric and asymmetric uh, structures. Using this standard deviation uh, of uh, uh, around the 0.3 nanometer as a threshold, we distinguished whether an oligoma was symmetric or asymmetric. At low uh, ATP concentrations, the transition frequency uh, between the symmetric and the asymmetric types was low, but it increased with uh, a higher ATP concentration. So based on this analysis, we calculated the transition frequency between symmetric cross ring and asymmetric structure, and found uh, that uh, the constant change of CAPB observed by AFM uh, caused by AT ATP hydrolysis. Okay, uh, this curve can be verified by the Michael Smith equation. So on the other hand, it's well known that CAPB's ATP activity exhibit a positive co cooperativity fit by the Hill equation is uh, n of uh, 2.6. So this 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 uh, uh, inconsistent suggests that while a hair observation only the, uh, the dynamics of ring homed oligomers, but uh, bulk ATP's active measurement include the protomers that are not in the ring formation with a low by, lower ATP S activity. So to further investigate whether the observed large conference change in the ring structure are related to the CAP function, we observed the mutants of the middle domain because the mutations at the amino acid located at the one at one end of the cold coil of the middle domain are known to show repressed and hyperactive states. The repressed mutant E423A lacks disaggregation activity while the hyperactive uh, mutant Y494D uh, exhibit high ATP is and substrate unfolded activities even without uh, heat shock protein 70 patterns. So in the action image, the repressed mutant displays both closed and open links, but the closed link structure was very stable and uh, showed less function change. On the other hand, the hyperactive mutant uh, predominantly consists consisted of open ring structures with only a few closed ring. Even at the high ATP levels, the transition to the closed rings uh, during the high-speed high FM imaging were hardly observed. So these results uh, strongly suggest that the open ring home of, of the CLPB has, has a high intrinsic activity. Because EM analysis uh, have shown previously uh, EM analysis have shown that in the repressed mutant, the middle domain is oriented uh, laterally allowing interactions between adjacent protomers. However, in the hyperactive mutant, the middle domain is inclined, indicating the disruption of interaction between the middle domain, uh, adjacent uh, neighboring middle domains. So this suggests that when the interactions among middle domains are disrupted, the ring structure becomes disassembled so the ability of the ring disruption may be a critical for the disruption activity. So lastly, uh, 
to investigate the role of the two ATP hydroxide uh, in TNPB, triple uh, one and triple two. Uh, Walker motif mutants lacking ATP binding and hydrolysis abilities are observed. Uh, here, uh, Walker A and Walker B mutants have lost ATP binding and hydrolysis abilities, respectively. So these results show the Walker A mutant in triple A1 displays the heterogeneous atypical original form, supporting a previous report that the nucleotide binding to triple A1 is essential for the oligomer assembly. On the other hand, the two KT AA mutant, which showed ring structure, indicates that nucleotide binding to triple A2 is uh, not essential for the ring formation. And interestingly, two A this mutant home the cross rings, but their uh, size varied widely, with some rings being significantly larger compared to the viral type. So this suggests also that ATP binding to the triple A2 control the number of subunits in the oligomer. So in the case of water, Walker B mutant of triple A1, uh, namely when the ATP hydrolysis ability is deficient, the structure of the out was similar to the wild type, uh, showing both symmetric and uh, asymmetric uh, rings. On the other hand, two EQ mutants showed only a symmetric ring and no conformational change. So this implies that the major structure change of the ring are uh, due to the HD hydrous in the triple two ring. So thus, by observing the mutant lacking ATP binding and hydrolysis ability, we can easily investigate the relationship between the ATP hydrolysis site and the structure uh, from the HPDFM image. Okay, now here's a summary of my talk. First, I've shown how high-speed FM visualizes uh, introduced structure change of the ring-shaped ATPs. Uh, next, we discussed how a high-speed FM allows us to understand the relationship between cooperative catalytic activity in the oligomeric ring and the conformational change in the subunit. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, I introduced a broader application of high-speed FM beyond just looking at change in individual subunit. This tool has probably invariable in revealing uh, large-scale structural dynamics, such as uh, cleaving and uh, reassembling uh, sub-shuffling of the ring structure. So at the last, I demonstrated how AT binding and hydrolysis at specific sites significantly impact the overall structures and the functional dynamics of oligomer by ozone the uh, mutant. So in summary, so HPD FM has uh, emerged as a uh, Pivotal tool in our ongoing explanation of the dynamics of protein structures, particularly in the context of ring shaped uh, ATPs. So, here's acknowledges. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Hiro Kinoji and uh, Ryota Ino to provide uh, to, to, to have uh, cooperation about f ATPs. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Murata about uh, v ATPs. And also Professor Ji Jun San in KAIST, and also uh, Yohei Watanabe in Kona University to provide a one and the shape in respectively. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Takeyuki. That was also just an amazing, beautiful story of how these ATPases work. So thank you. Um, wait for a couple of questions, I guess. One, what we'll do is have a few questions for you, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Simon to lead the general discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I congratulations to you on being so on time. I know it's you know so late for you, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm impressed that you can do that. At one a.m. I guess is where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one question that I have is in these studies. How much do you need to know what to look for in your confirmations? I can see you see different images, but I'm just wondering mm -hmm. what is, yeah. How do you know how much do you need to know what to look for? Or how much, how can you detect rare things that might be really important? Uh, so uh, well, I guess so you, that... have, you have different structures and different confirmations that you mm -hmm. can classify. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, um, as you delve deeper and deeper into these systems, mm -hmm. you know, 
how, what's the capacity? Like, you know, sometimes you only get what you look for, I guess is what I'm wondering about. And how much can you see an unexpected pentamer, you know, but it's, 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 a, it's a, but an unexpected confirmation that might be not much represented, but really crucial. So I'm just wondering how mm -hmm. much does it get biased by what you expect to see and how can we go further in seeing new things? Okay. That if we have a crystal structure depending on nucleotide states so we can expect which kind of confirmation we should observe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but in the case of CUPB, this case so uh, actually uh, our echo was a bit of showed very uh, heterogeneous structures it's unexpected so Actually, uh, it's for those. It's very hard to uh, say how much sort of confirmation states exist only with FM. Is, mm -hmm. is that is it answer? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a frontier, right? To me, mm -hmm. in terms of these, you know, new capa capacities of, to image better, faster, and then to develop software to then mm -hmm. be able to dig deeper, right? Because yeah. you have these complex systems and, and these mechanisms aren't always what you expect based on a crystal structure, for example, right? So yes, I'm just and the actually this EM structure shows a very stable ring structure. So I expected to see this kind of structure. But when I observed these shape EVs, most of ring is broken and asymmetric. So I started this experiment uh, to uh, 2011, and this spiral structure uh, uh, reported in 2016. So about around five years, I couldn't understand why we observe this asymmetric structure. And my collaborators usually say this is uh, this asymmetric and opening structure is uh, uh, artifact. So the only this symmetric structure is a real structure, but actually it's I really observe this symmetric structure. If I observe this symmetric structure, it's easily broken or changed to asymmetric structure. But without this quality of structure, actually I couldn't uh, I can't be sure if the FM image is actual structure or just artifact. It was very hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, it's exciting though. Mm -hmm. um, I'll I'll mention again. So George has also answered some questions already. They tend to come in, so mm -hmm. the answered questions are in the in the Q and A. Um, does anybody? I, I haven't I, I had you guys actually ask each other things. So maybe I'll just. I have a question to to Takayuki. No. I mean, I think it cannot be stressed enough how how. Uh, new this stuff is the Takayuki shows and I, I, I'm to the best of my knowledge from seminars I see from cryo-electron microscopists they are running around the world uh, based on static structures showing this this hand over hand uh, mechanism <laughs> and it has entirely entered the way of the way that most of the people think about these machines and i think takayuki what you show is really a, a, a revolution in that field and the fact that you have seen this a long time ago um should should enforce us to be more confident in ourselves you know that uh, that these these findings are very important now I have a question regarding um I think it is was in the beginning of the clip B P talk mm -hmm. uh, part uh, when you see more or less a stochastic blinking of the subunits right mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how sure can you be let's see let's say uh, I would be a, a, an absolute uh, uh, affiliated of the hand over hand motion uh, theory that you're not just not missing, you're just missing the intermediate steps because of let's mm -hmm. say high resolution. Let's say you see one, then you miss two, and then you see the, the one on the other side uh, uh, active. So so how can how can you, you can be the uh 
insufficient time resolution to the actual uh, sequential motion. Yeah. Yes, but uh, uh, if it's just time uh, problem of temporal resolution, if we change the ATP concentration, it should be uh, possible to see. But yeah. we couldn't see any uh, say, uh, sequential motion. But actually, we expect it, but we couldn't see. But one problem with this experiment is we can't put a uh, substrate. This is this. I tried to uh, observe substrate, but I couldn't observe. So if the uh, CPV trap substrate, situation may change, but uh, uh, I, I, yeah, that's one weak point of this, this study, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess I have a question. What would you all kind of, um, what do you anticipate? So there have been these advances, obviously, and you can see now these new things about how these proteins work and their dynamics and um, they're at higher resolution and increased different timescales. So that's kind of where it's at. People are just kind of getting there because it's not yet easy for anyone to do that. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, what do you anticipate next for your field? Or what would you like to see next? What I'd love is for more people to do these things. I'd love to be able to do it. I mean, I think there's a lot of power here to to get new perspectives. So maybe you can each comment on this, what you think is uh, most exciting and where next. Yeah. Well, may I I may take that uh, at least. Um, so from from a pure structural biology uh, perspective, I think most of these things, in some of the ways, what I I showed with the with the tetramer and the pentamer, and what Takayuki showed, I think a lot of our thinking comes from the fact that structural biology has been so strongly driven by the perfect biochemistry. And that most of the people, all of those people, structural biologists, have been basically trained to to look exactly at at the most abundant protein species, biochemically, and then through averaging processes and and crystallization before. And crystallization is a good example. By definition, you could only find one species, right? That that is uh, diffracting. And in some ways, uh, the biochemistry, by just looking at a, a very defined species in the overall Gaussian distribution, I think we are often um, just finding um, a little bit what we are looking for. And I, I guess in Takayuki's case too, if we were just uh, able to actually characterize, and I think cryo-EM is, for example, also able to do that, a larger range of things and take it seriously. Uh, I think many of these uh, uh, structural uh, heterogeneities would have been or should be discoverable by by not only by high speed AFM. High speed AFM can bring in the dynamics, but uh, I think other methods. To, if we just step out of this idea that we we like to see one structure that we can start to understand and wrap our brain around, it would be possible to find many other methods that can be more open-minded and, and bring these aspects in. And George, what do you think? Maybe I'll ask you, since you spoke of those technical aspects specifically, what do you think? What are the barriers? What What is the... Do you think we're close? Can we go faster at integrating these things? I think probably the main barrier at the moment to high-speed AFM becoming more widely available might be the technology. I mean, there are not so many high-speed AFMs around the world, and it also needs a lot of technical expertise to kind of run them. <clears throat> I think this is maybe improving with... Um, larger companies now trying to offer um, high-speed AFM. So they're kind of beginning to catch up 
with the the first developments of high speed AFM. And I think that will begin to penetrate more and more to AFM groups around the world. Um, they may they may not necessarily use it with the kind of protein dynamics in mind, but I, I think eventually they will see the the gap to kind of do that kind of work. Um, and um, I think the speed is already very valuable as we've seen in the talks today. Um, pushing it will allow us to access more faster dynamics, but um, that's probably not the main barrier, I think. Um, it's kind of getting a bigger user base, uh, making it easier to use, easier to analyze um, is probably the main barrier from my opinion anyway. I mean, I'm thinking too, you know, for other systems, we've seen these membrane systems, but you could think about, for example, aggregation is something I think about other systems, right? Could you look at something deposited and look at things adding on, look at assembly mechanisms, right? So I can imagine that would be really cool. <laughs> other kinds of systems too. You have to always think about the surface, but, you know, then you can, you can add things um, potentially or tether things. Right. I'm thinking of other technical aspects, tether them. So then you can see other things, tether them in a way that, you know, the surface isn't creating a problem. With the membrane, it's easier you can sit things on top. But, um... Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's been lots of 2D assembly. Lateral assembly is quite easy to look with the, the AFM. And it should be possible in 3D, which depends on mm. the resolution that you need, whether you need to know the orientation. And uh, it's probably quite system specific uh, for that but mm. sounds very possible i was thinking too about energetics right so if you coming back to takayuki's systems like if you know you've got the the different mutants you've got different assemblies and and how often you see them in things i'm wondering to what extent that can get you towards energetics a landscape Counting things up, I wondered. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I I think these are absolutely possible things. I mean, to 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 measure. I mean, at least equilibrium distributions and and get some idea of of equilibrium energetics out uh, from states. I wanted to to come back to to what you said. Uh, you know how to make it a, a little bit more. Uh, abundant and and hope that more people jump on it. Um, I I have to hope that more electron microscopists uh, uh, will join the movement because um, they have maybe less um, um, they are less afraid maybe of, of some technical challenges to overcome. Um, I think the problem from the AFM community is, is that uh, a lot of the people who are classically doing AFM do it in surface chemistry and semiconductor physics. And for them, biology is quite a dirty thing. And and so they they may have been reluctant to enter the biology field. On the other hand, I think in the as it becomes if the revolution in cryo EM much more easy or accessible to solve structures. And there is undisputably a move towards analyzing dynamics in molecules in the field. Uh, for example, you can see the success of threat, right, uh, measurements. So I believe that maybe those uh, fields in, in, in biology like uh, very um, um, advanced optical microscopists and electron microscopists who are used to and and like also to to kind of like to use their hands and 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 work on a machine. These people, I think, are maybe most likely to to um, jump on this and and solve and try to complement their static structures with with the with the dynamic studies by high speed afm that's my hope mm. Mind? Mm. george takayuki do you yeah i think uh as a problem afm is uh cheap structure is very unstable so it's very hard to get uh, same result all the time 
This is different from optical microscopy or electron microscopy, I think. Even the sample is very good. Uh, if we can't have good tip, we can't have same results. So we have, it takes more time to get good results. Uh, it's a, a challenging thing. And I think straightforward development is uh, first uh, speed and higher resolution like uh, George's work. But another aspect of FM is, you know, FM can uh, prove not only topography, but also uh, physical property of samples. Yeah. So, yeah that's one uh, technical uh, development for high-speed FM. So if high-speed can observe, detect, not only topography, but also mechanical or uh, electrical pro properties of a uh, protein, it, and uh, we can get dynamics, it might be uh, become advantage to other techniques because other techniques can't talk directly detect the uh, physical properties of proteins. That's, I think, one direction, apart from the straightforward uh, technical uh, development. Yeah. Could you say a bit more about that for the non-experts? So one thing that I'll say is, you know, this recording goes on YouTube, and what we find sometimes is it really takes off later as people start to understand, you know, more about how, you know, what the potential is. So. So to to elaborate a bit more on your properties of your assemblies, how do you how do you do that with AFM? Ah, so in terms of AFM, uh, touch the surface, so we can uh, detect uh, holes with high sensitive is uh, high speed. Is basic in principle, it should be possible to uh, observe topography and uh, the mechanical proper distribution in protein. And also, if there's some distribution, this may reflect the uh, ion distribution or yeah, some water properties on. Yeah. As uh, the normal uh, low speed FM, so some people report uh, uh, to to detect uh, the mechanical property and uh, charge distribution of protein. So if we can implement this uh, ability to the first uh, detection, so in the future it might be possible to see the dynamics of the mechanical or electrical properties on, on protein. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, that would also be nice to mm -hmm. integrate that as well to this. Mm -hmm. Can that, do you, have, do you have to have completely different instruments for those things, I guess? I don't know anything about it, how to do it. I, I don't think we need uh, particularly different instruments. In, in principle, the idea is, is that since the cantilever, the tip uh, swings, right? The cantilever swings and intermittently contacts the tip with the sample. That basically, if you read out the swinging of the cantilever from the phase, the amplitude and the phase behavior of yeah, the cantilever, yeah. you can get out these uh, mechanical properties. That this is basically the approach that that has to be developed and uh, and further uh, developed. But there's no no uh, technical uh, barrier i would say that that we can read out permanently at high high speed uh, the mechanical properties of molecules as we touch them it's one of the main advantages of afm yeah yeah it's a little bit like when you use a hammer and you hit against the wall mm -hmm. Uh, depending on, you will immediately sense if you're hitting on a on a hard wall or into a sponge, right? So that's that's uh, I would say the analogy of that. And and since you you're sensing the oscillation, uh, and the, this and you can deduce the dissipation and so on, you can get the mechanical properties out. And there, as as Takayuki mentioned, there are all from from classical AFM obviously already tons of applications and studies out there that show the, the, this possibility it's not fully explode, exploited mm -hmm. at, at high high speed 
yeah, I was thinking like, can you pull things off or see how they fall apart and all that sort of thing. So there's, there's more prospects there too. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, I see we're drawing to our time conclusion here. So I'd like to thank you all again so much for, for being here and sharing this amazing science with us. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for being here and also uh, Raluca and Shannon for making this all so smooth technically. Um, and uh, with that, I yeah, would like to sign off. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank Lynn, you very much. And, and the society for hosting us. Hey, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you all for, for doing this. We appreciate it. Yes, it thank you. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Bye Take bye. care. Okay. Bye. I go back.